Well, good morning again, church. Well, good morning again, Pastor. It is a blessed day today to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Proverbs 22, 1 declares that a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And so that begs the question, then, doesn't it? How's your name? How is your name? In other words, when people hear your name mentioned, what words might come to their mind when they hear your name? Are you seen as someone who is trustworthy and truthful? Do people see you as caring? Do they see you as loving? Or maybe the words patient, kind, and understanding, are those good words to describe you? Are you known as a man or a woman of your word? In other words, whenever you tell someone something, do they instantly, instantly believe you and trust you that if you say something that you're going to do what you say you'll do? In other words, is your word your bond? My grandfather, he always told me, he said this, he said, son, he said, say what you mean and mean what you say. That's always his words to me. And so integrity and trust go hand in hand. And if you have a good name and people know that you are trustworthy, people can have faith that if you say it, you will do it. As a Christian, we've actually been given the greatest name, the name above all names. And we cannot take that responsibility and that honor lightly, and nor should we. In other words, when we take the name of Christ upon ourselves, we are actually claiming to be His representatives. When someone says, are you a Christian? In other words, are they saying, are you a Christ follower? Are you one of His disciples? 2 Corinthians 5.20 actually refers to those who claim to be Christians, those who take the name of Christ upon themselves. 2 Corinthians 5.20 refers to Christians this way. It says that we are ambassadors for Christ Himself, as though God were pleading through us to be reconciled to God. And so we must guard our name for the gospel's sake because God cannot lie and God will not lie. And when God makes a promise, he will see that that promise is kept. But you know, that's just one of the many endless reasons that we worship him. Last week we looked at what worship looked like, what worship is. This week we're going to look at another aspect, and that's called covenant. The Hebrew word for covenant is actually berif, berif. And it holds the meaning of a contract, a legal agreement that we come into. But in the ancient Near East, in other words, in the, in the time when, when the Bible was written, in the ancient times, the foundational concept of covenant making was something that was called fictive kinship. Fictive kinship. In other words, when two people or two parties would enter into buddy, in other words, they would enter into a covenant, they would make someone kin who was not kin. In other words, they come into the family. They become like a family. That was the level of the agreement that they were making when they come into this buddy, this covenant. And so if you needed somebody to act like a family member and you were willing to give that person the rights and the privilege of a family member, you would invite that individual or perhaps that tribe or nation into a covenant agreement which created this fictive kinship, this kind of family. Today, we can best understand this concept of fictive kinship in the terms of, say, marriage to people who are strangers or and now come together into this marriage covenant. Or it can also be seen in the covenant of adoption. When you adopt someone and they take upon your name, they become part of the family. And so let's go ahead and let's dig into God's Word. Stand as you're able, and we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 9. We'll be looking at the first 17 verses. Stand as you're able to honor the reading of God's Holy Word, Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, starting at verse 1, says, And so God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and of all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely, 
For your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. For whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful, multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply in it. And then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. And thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. And Father, as we look into your word, we pray that your spirit will be with us today to teach us through your word, to open our minds and our hearts to your truth. Father, we pray that your spirit will go ahead of the message today and plow up our hearts so that the seeds of the gospel will fall into good soil today and much fruit will be brought forth from your word. And Father, we just want to thank you and praise you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, there's several things that I want you to notice in this section that we just read today. First, I want you to notice God uses the word Bari, covenant, seven times just in this short little section. Seven times he uses the word <clears throat> covenant. Now, I may ask the question then, well, he uses the word so many times, does that mean that there's some super spiritual meaning behind him speaking that word seven times? Well... Perhaps. Perhaps it could be because seven is the number of completion. It's, a, it's seen as the perfect number. And so he wants to show that this is his complete and his perfect promise to never again destroy the world by flood again. Perhaps. Or maybe he just wants to get it through our thick, untrusting heads that he's not going to destroy the world through a flood again. And so that we can trust him. And so he's going to say it over and over again to make sure that we really get it. You can take from it what you will as far as that, him using it seven times. But the other thing is this. The covenant, which is often referred to as the, no, the Noahic covenant, comes from Noah, had five specific guidelines and terms. Like, for instance, number one, man was to once again be fruitful and multiply. It was his duty now to fill the earth. To fill the earth. Now, I want to stop there for a second. Who's heard the argument people like to use? And they might say, well, the earth is overcrowded right now. Or the earth is overpopulated. Has anybody ever heard that before? Anybody ever heard people say, oh, yeah. trying to say that? Well, though you actually use that argument as a means to justify sterilization and abortion and even euthanasia. The world's just too crowded. We just need to start getting rid of some people. Allow people to die. But God says be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. But isn't the earth overpopulated? Isn't it overcrowded? Well, I'm going to give you some scientific facts. Did you know that there are between 7.5 to 7.6 billion human beings on earth today? That's billions with a B. 7.5 to 7.6 Billion. Now that sounds like a lot, right? Sounds like a lot of people. Well, that is until you realize that the state of Texas, just this one little state alone, has exactly 
494,271,488,000 square feet. That equals out to about 268,820 square miles. What's that got to do with anything? Well, I'm glad you asked. When you divide the square foot by the number of people on the planet, you get 1,084.76 square feet per person, which is approximately 33 feet by 33 feet plot of land for every single human on the face of the earth. So there's enough room in Texas alone for every human, I mean every human, from baby all the way up to elderly, every single human to have a 33 foot by 33 foot plot of land. That's the, enough space for a small townhouse. And that Texas alone could hold every single human being from baby to elderly, leaving the rest of the planet uninhabited. So it kind of goes to show you that God knows what he's talking about and that he knows better than we do. So number one, the first stipulation in turn was that man was to spread out over the entire earth, be fruitful, and be multiplied. That was a command from God. Number two, animals would now instinctively fear mankind. So you can imagine up to this point, animals did not fear man. You know, today if you see a deer, you see an animal, a dog, they might look at you, cower, and then run away. It wasn't like that in the beginning. But I believe that this second thing, this instinctive fear for man, actually ties in with the third thing. It's this, that now humans for the first time are allowed to eat animals for food. They had not done that. According to Scripture, for the first 1,600 years of creation, humans were vegetarians. But don't take my word for it. I want to show you in Scripture. Hold your place in Genesis 9. And let's turn back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 through 30. Genesis 1, starting at verse 29. Amen when you're there. Amen. All right, Genesis 1, starting at verse 29. Listen to God's word. And God said, see, and he's speaking to mankind. See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth. And every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. And so humans and animals alike in the beginning were vegetarian. They were plant eaters. Yes, that means even the dinosaurs. Even the dinosaurs were plant eaters. Because it says every beast of the earth. But in order to eat meat, something had to die. And before the fall, before sin entering the world, there was no death. There was no death. Death did not exist. Because God had proclaimed that everything was not just good, but everything was very good. So death was not in the world. So everything just ate fruits and vegetables and plants. But how does this instinctive fear of man then tie into this, of man being permitted to eat animals? Well, I see that instinctive fear of man for animals, I see that as God's mercy and God's grace to the animal. I mean, think about it. Instead of, if animals didn't have a fear of man, they would just walk right up to man and they could be easily captured and killed and eaten. But instead now, God shows grace and mercy. Now they, have, now they run, now they hide, and they actually have a chance to multiply and live on. And so God is merciful. The fourth thing that I see, though, in this, and that you can see, is that life is precious. Amen? Amen. Amen. Life is precious. Life is of utmost value. Life is of so much value that it is to be protected. Life is to be guarded. And God is so serious about how precious life is that it's God who actually institutes capital punishment. Did you read that in here? Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. And so regardless of, of your feelings of capital punishment, some people can't stand the idea. God's word demands the just sentence of life for life. Again, verse 6, whoever shed man's blood, by, man's, by man his blood shall be shed. For the image of God he made man. In other words, so according to to God's word, when someone murders another human being, they are guilty of destroying the very image of God. That's why abortion is such a heinous, satanic act. 
And Satan knows, Satan knows, he cannot do anything to God. There's nothing that Satan can do to God. So what does he do? Instead, he influences human beings who are created in the image of God to murder those image bearers. And it's an egregious sin in God's eyes. Friends, murder is wicked. Amen? Amen. Murder is evil. And God says that if you shed man's blood, you should be put to death. Now, once you understand, though, this is not speaking of being a vigilante, just going out and taking things into your own hands. It's not speaking of that. This is talking about a legal justice, capital punishment. But you know, as we read this in Genesis 9, this is speaking of the physical act of committing murder. But under the new covenant, the prophets had said that when the Messiah would come, that he would actually magnify the law. He would explain it to its true intent. And so Jesus magnified the intent of the law to say that if you have hatred in your heart for another human being, if you have anger without just cause, you have no real reason to be angry or dislike this person. You just don't like him. You just have anger toward him. God says that his word says that you're guilty of murder in your heart and you are in danger of judgment. That's how high his standard is. God takes life seriously. The fifth thing, though, is that God promises. God gives his word that never again will he destroy the earth by the floodwaters. He's not going to cause a great flood to come upon the earth again and destroy the entire world. This, however, does not mean that he's not going to bring judgment back upon the earth. That's not what this is saying. But many people today, they do not believe that God will again destroy the earth. They believe, a lot of people, that God is only a God of love. Now, that is one facet. And absolutely, yes, God is the very definition of love. The Bible even says God is love. And that can be reversed. Love is God. But we can't forget He's also a God of righteousness. He is a holy God. And He's a God who hates sin. Turn over, hold your place in Genesis 9 and turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. We'll look a little more in depth at this. 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter comes right before 1 John. 2 Peter comes right after 1 Peter. So 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse number 1. Amen when you're there. Amen. Amen. Peter is writing to believers, and he says this in chapter 3 of 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 1. He says, Beloved, he's writing to the church, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Do we see that today, church? Do we see scoffers today? Walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willingly, for, willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness 
dwells. Friends, the evidence is all around us. All around us. All you have to do is look in nature. Nature today testifies of the flood of God's wrath back in Noah's day. You remember the video that you, we watched. And it also, though, stands as a warning to sinful, unrepentant humanity that God keeps His word. He says He'll do it. He will do it. And friends, according to His word, He will once again bring judgment. And for us as born-again Christ followers, it also serves as a catalyst for us to get up out of our seats and go and warn people before it's too late. There's something else I want you to see, and that's how God phrases His words. Notice back, if we go back to Genesis 9, how He refers, He says in, in verse 9, in verse 11, in verse 15, He refers to the covenant as my covenant. My covenant, he says. Here God is taking on the responsibility of maintaining the covenant. You see, man, man had no part in establishing the covenant with God. Because breaking a covenant had dire consequences in their culture. The sole object of the agreement was something that was called chesed. And it meant a covenant loyalty. We sometimes translate that as loving kindness. To abide by the covenant was said that you were to show love. But if you were to betray or fail to keep the covenant, that was, to show, that was considered to show hatred. Considered to show hatred. But God made the covenant promise, and He did it because God cannot, God cannot lie. He cannot betray. He cannot lie. And He will never fail to keep His word. He will always keep His word. And this is also, this is similar, it harkens back to the covenant that He made with Abraham. If you were to fast forward through Genesis to about 12 through 15, in Abraham's day, when covenants were made, two parties would erect two altars. You would have an altar here and an, and an altar here. And then the two parties would, sat, would take an animal. And they would take that animal and they would cut the animal in two. And they would place part on this altar and then part on this altar. And then the two people would take turns and they would walk between the two altars of the slaughtered animal. And what they were essentially were saying is that, friend, if I break this treaty with you, may the fate of these animals be my fate. But when God, it's interesting to note in chapter 15, when God made that great covenant with Abram, and he had Abram sacrifice the animal on the altar, Scripture testifies that God put Abram to sleep. He put Abram to sleep. And then it was God himself, he alone, who passed between the sacrifice. Because he knew that if Abram was to walk through, if man was to walk through, man would sin. Man would lie. Man would betray. And ultimately, man would break the covenant. But God never could. And so he alone passed between the two pieces. And then back in chapter 9, God says that his covenant is between himself and every living creature. And he says that this covenant is going to be an everlasting covenant. That Hebrew word for everlasting is olam. It means is perpetual. It's indefinite. And it's unending. It will never end. And as a sign of the promise, he gave humanity the rainbow. You know, we kind of take it for granted today. It does take your breath away, though. A storm, rain hits, and what do you always say? Look, the rainbow. You know, but really, that's about as far as it goes, other than maybe we take a picture of it and send it to people. Hey, I saw a rainbow today. But really, if we think about God gave as a promise, I'm never going to destroy the world again by a flood. Every time we see the rainbow, we should just drop to our knees and thank you, God, for your mercy. And it's a reminder that God is a holy God, and God hates sin, so much so that he destroyed the entire world except for eight people and the animals that were on the ark. And he's going to do it again. He gave that promise to humanity. And you know, the rainbow at that point was something they had never seen before. Because according to Scripture, it had never rained before. There was a mist that came up from the ground. And so it was something amazing, something unique. And he did that because you can imagine that Noah and his family, the first time a, ma a massive thunderstorm hit, 
You got to imagine they might have just did a little bit harkened back, PTSD, if you will, thinking back about, oh, wow, the storm, how they had heard the, the cries and the thunder and the rain and the pounding on the sides of the ark and the people wanting to get in, but it was too late for them. The roaring of the earth ripping open. They were thinking, is it happening again? Is it happening again? And then all of a sudden the clouds break, a little sunshine comes out, and that rainbow goes across the sky. Can you imagine they were like, <sighs> they breathe a sigh of relief. And they know that when God makes a promise, God keeps His promises. And as Christians, as God's representatives, you know what? He expects us to keep our word too. He expects us to keep our word. Take, for instance, the marriage covenant. A man and woman, they leave their mother and father, and they unite together to become one flesh. They become one. They enter into a holy covenant between themselves before God Almighty. Husband and wife are no longer under the authority of their parents at that time. And that's hard for us parents. But no longer are they under our authority. But now they have entered into a covenant with God. And God is now their direct authority. And now they are held accountable to God for what they do and how they live their lives. They are no longer under their parents. But then the parents have children. And now their children are under the authority of the parents. And the parents again under the authority of God. And so the children live in covenant with their parents. But it's a covenant that's initiated by the parents, you see. The children, they had no say. Did you know you had no say in being born? You didn't have any say in that. You didn't. <laughs> and that's actually, it's a picture, when we think about the family, it's a picture of the spiritual rebirth and adoption into God's family. You had no say in being born the first time, and you actually have no say in being born the second time. You see, it's God who initiates the rebirth. It's God who initiates that call in your life. The Bible says that in our dead state, we can't call out to God. We can't even seek out to God unless He first calls us. And so He initiates that. He is the one that sparks life in a once dead soul. He brings us to life. He raises us from death to life and He creates within us a new life. And we become a new creation. And then we, as believers, enter into a covenant with God Himself. I want to mention 1 Samuel 18. Everyone's familiar with David. Perhaps you're familiar with David and, and his best friend Jonathan. They were close. They actually they made a covenant. If you read 1 Samuel 18, you'll find that they made a covenant with one another. Now that bereave, that covenant, the word means literally to cut. It was said you were to cut a covenant. Jewish scholars, whenever they describe this section, that the covenant that they made together was a blood covenant. What the ancient customs would prescribe in that day was two men, two parties, they would, they would bear their arms and they would take a sharp dagger and they would cut their forearms, drawing blood, and they would reach out and they would grab each other's arms. Thus, they would intermingle that blood and they would become what we know today as blood brothers. But then, as a reminder of this covenant, they would take ashes and they would just smear ashes all in that cut, in that wound, to cause a permanent scar on their forearm. That way, years later, years later, they could look down and they would remember that covenant, that commitment that they had made to one another. But why do I mention that? Why do I mention that? Well, today we're, we are going to take communion. Christ said that, do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread, break it. Take the bread, which is my body, which is broken for you. Drink the cup, which is my blood of the new covenant, which has been shed for you for the remission, for the forgiveness of your sins. And when we take communion, we are to remember this is a symbol of his sacrifice. We don't just come up, get bread, you know, drink the cup, eat the bread, it's done. You're supposed to be remembering Christ's sacrifice. But friends, did you know that according to Scripture, Jesus today still bears the scars of the covenant that He made with you and me? Scripture testifies to that. It says in the book of Revelation, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold a Lamb who looks like He's been slain. Christ today still bears the scars. And for those of us who are born again in the Spirit, instead of God's wrath, Christ looks upon the scars 
And he says, there is no longer any condemnation now for you, my child. When God promises to save you, His word is His bond. You can trust Him. You have heard that the old saying, once saved, always saved, but I need to add a caveat to that. It's this. It's not once saved, always saved, but if you are saved, you are always saved because it's of God. It's not of you. Christ came in the world to save sinners. Amen? Amen. And He came in the world and He kept all of God's laws perfectly. He never sinned once, not in thought, in word, in deed. And then this perfectly innocent man suffered and died a criminal's death. As one perfect eternal life traded for all who would believe. For all those who are called. And one day, when we breathe our last breath here, we will take our next breath in His presence and we will see those scars for ourselves. And then we will at last know what true love really is. It was a covenant. True love is a covenant that was ratified in the blood and the scars of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And friends, that covenant is an everlasting covenant covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. But this covenant is not seen in a rainbow in the sky. It's, it's seen in us today. It's seen in a changed heart and a changed mind. It's seen in us being a new creation. We are not who we once were. We don't live that way. We don't talk that way. We don't think that way. God has erected a new life within us. That is the sign of that new covenant today. A people who truly love God, who truly love God, not just in our words, but in everything that we do. And we're people who truly love people and we want to see people saved. And that's because God is living within us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, most of all that, Father, we know that you cannot lie, that your word is truth. This word, the Bible, your word is where we get all of our knowledge of what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for your promise that, Lord, you said that you will save those who repent and come unto you through repentance and faith. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Thank you, God, that you first saw us, a people who didn't look for you. We wanted to live our own life, but you found us. And, Father, if there's ones here today who do not know you as their Lord and Savior. And Father, most of all, if you do not know them as one of your children, Father, convict their heart and their mind today. Father, I pray that the gospel message, Lord, I pray that that thought will be like a splinter in their mind. that They will not have another good night's sleep until they have wrestled with you and they have gotten right with you, Lord, that you have done that work, that you have changed their heart and their mind and that you have adopted them into your family and given them your name. That's my prayer today, Father. And it's each, each and everyone's prayer here today that has family and friends who are lost. And Father, there may be many of those who claim to be Christians, but Lord, you don't know them. Their lives are not changed. They are not one of your sheep. Father, your word says your sheep will hear your voice. And so, Father, today I pray your sheep does hear your voice and that you will save some today. And, Father, we just thank you and we praise you. In Christ Jesus' name, amen.